this is Jeff Hajek here. I am the owner and founder of Black Sheep Lease Improvement. I'd like to welcome you to this latest episode of the Gotta Go Mean blog. Over the years, I've helped my son um, by being an assistant coach on many of his Little League baseball teams. And as I've watched these kids develop over the time, I've noticed that there's quite a bit of difference in the way the kids approach sports. It dawned on me that this is a great opportunity to talk about PDCA, the Plan, Do, Check, Act um, cycle. It's also known as the Deming cycle. But it's a way of approaching problems in a very systematic manner. And many people do that in trying to improve sports without even really recognizing it. But the first step of coming up with a solution to a problem is really the hardest, and that is to actually acknowledge that there is a problem. So there's some pre-work that goes into any problem-solving effort. So even if you're using the PDCA cycle, you don't even start it. You don't even start the problem-solving effort until you acknowledge that something is wrong, that you want to make a change. And once you decide that, it's not automatic that you're going to jump into the problem-solving solution um, methodology. You still have to decide whether or not it's worth it. So there's a, a prioritization that goes into it. So the kids on the team, the first thing I that, that they probably think of is, yeah, I really want to be good at baseball. I want to be able to hit the ball over the fence. I want to catch everything that comes my way. But then they'd start thinking about saying, well, that means a lot of practice. If I give up time, um, if I start practicing a lot, that means I'm giving up time for schoolwork. Uh, it means that I may not have as much time for video games. I can't hang out with my friends as much. Um, maybe they'll be playing with their friends on the field, but it might not be the exact, um, their closest friends may not also love baseball the same way. So they start making this decision about whether or not they really, really want to put the effort into solving that problem. And in their mind, they start doing a little bit of mental math and say, well, I'm pretty good now. It won't take that much effort or I got a lot of work to do. So it's going to take a lot of effort. And we do the same thing in, in the shop floor or in the office. We look at a problem and we start deciding whether or not this is the battle we want to fight. Now, in the uh, the work environment, we often have metrics to go along with that. So we want to be able to take a look at the numbers and say, these are our biggest problems and make an assessment about um, which one should we go after first. Now, the challenge is you have to use a little bit of gut feel mixed in with a lot of scientific management, uh, numerical-based management. But the problem is, Getting those numbers takes time and effort, so you can't collect numbers on every single thing that you may consider improving. So going back to the kids, let's say a kid decides that they really do want to put the effort into it. Um, there's also a role of the leaders in in this problem-solving effort. And, you know, bosses and senior engineers, um, they're the ones who guide the efforts in, in the work environment. But you have parents and teachers and coaches who provide the leadership for kids. So depending on the style of the coaches and leadership, they can either bring kids forward and kind of help in a way where they create followership, or they can be pushy and make the kids start to resist. And the same thing happens again in the workplace is you want to create a leadership environment that makes people want to solve problems. And they want you want them to see that there's a problem. You want them to see it as worth it to go after the the uh, improvement effort. So with kids, um, if a kid is on the fence and you push them too hard, they tend to resist. So I see some, some of the kids doing that. There's kids that they can't get enough of um, playing time or you know, practice time. And there's other kids that seem like they get pushed into it and they get dragged out by their parents and they don't really want to be there. And it's pretty easy to tell which kids are which. So as a leader and a parent, you have to make sure that you really match your style to the needs of the kids or the, the, the workforce. So once you've decided that there's a problem and it's worth solving it and you have the right leadership in place and the right leadership styles in place, obviously with kids, you can't change the parent, but you can change the way the parent interacts with the child. Now you have to start um, figuring out what you're going to do to make the improvement. So let's say the problem is in batting and your child is not batting as well as they want to, and you have decided that it's worth it to effort and worth the effort to improve, and the kid has decided they want to put the time into it. So the first thing is to say how things should be. So in the workplace environment, you might go out and do um, benchmarking tours or a lot of research online. For kids in batting, you might watch other kids bat. You might try and get some coaching. 
you might go and read some books. You might go on YouTube. YouTube is a great resource now for um, youth sports. But the problem is, is that you just never know exactly which one is the right way because there's frequently different methodologies that are taught by different videos. But the whole point of this is in the beginning of your, your P, your plan um, part of the cycle, you have to learn how things should be. And then once you decide what the right way to do things is, you have to look at your child and assess their current state. Now, this is where it gets kind of tricky because you really need honest assessments. You need uh, realistic assessments. And you run into um, kind of a catch-22 situation here because, you know, typically the parent is the one who has the most insight into their kids. They understand what makes them tick, how they operate, what the their triggers are, whether they're good under pressure situations or um, anything like that. So they kind of have a better understanding of the, the how the kid operates. But often there is a familiarity that goes into it. So when you're a parent, you may be biased in what you perceive. And this means that you can, you know, for a kid batting, if they ground into um, a lot of ground outs, to make a lot of ground outs, you may be attributing that to unlucky location or great plays while other people look at it and say they hit a lot of ground balls. And you can be biased in how you do it. So you want to have a good balance in the the feedback. And a lot of times it means looking at specific numbers. Now, the current um, little league environment, there's a lot of um, online tracking that teams do now. They have uh, score books that are online and they compile stats for you. So you can get a lot of that information. Some of you have nice little spray charts. So you can take a really good look and have an understanding of exactly how a person is doing. The same thing happens in the shop floor. Managers of a process often have a very biased view of that process, and in large part it's because they often helped develop it. So it's like their baby, and when somebody comes in and says there's something wrong with it or it's not performing as it should, there gets to be a little bit of a, a resistance that forms up. So you really need an honest feedback, and that means often trying to balance the person with close knowledge of the process or the child and an outsider such as a coach or a uh, consultant. But once you decide that you know how things should be and you understand the current state, you have to identify the gap. Now, the gap can be tricky because the gap implies that you know how far you can actually go. Now, with kids uh, on the baseball field, there's some kids that just aren't big enough. You know, the physics just aren't there for them to hit the ball over the fence. So if their goal is to be a home run hitter, it just isn't going to happen in some situations. And the same thing happens in the shop floor. There's often situations that preclude you from reaching particular targets. So you can look at it and say, what would it take to close that gap? Or given the current situation, you accept that there are limits and you set the gap according to those limits. But whatever you do, whatever you decide, you need to have a plan to close that gap. And that plan is going to really tell you if you have you know, enough gas in the tank to close that gap, if you have enough ability to make changes to close the gap. And when I talk about the plan, I want to have a very specific plan. I want to have step A will close it by 2%. Step B will close it by 4%. Um, so you want to do a little thing called you know, problem-solving calculus and make sure that all the changes you plan on making will get you there. And then once you make that plan, you know, if, once you decide what you're going to do, the coaching steps you need to take, the things you need to work on for your kid on the baseball field or in the, in the shop floor – you go and do it. And the do is pretty easy. You implement the plan. You have a plan and you take the actions. Now, some of these steps are going to take a little bit of feedback. You might put the same on paper. And then when you get out on the shop floor and try and do it, you run into a challenge because it's not exactly um, playing out the way you wanted it to. So you make a little cycle back. You figure out what went wrong, make the changes and make it go right. So that's the do step. And after you've done it and got all your plan completed, everything's implemented, you have to check. You go and see if the plan has made improvements. Now, in baseball, you get some pretty immediate feedback. You can watch how the kid does in the next game and see if they're getting better contact, if they're getting hits, if their average is going up. On the shop floor, same way. You have metrics. You can tell if the productivity is improving. So the check step is basically use numbers and decide if you've made improvements. Now, I keep saying numbers. That's one of the challenges, especially in the office, is that you often don't have numbers on something that's 
a little bit more of a creative side of a problem or, you know, there's a creative process. Problems associated with that may have a little bit more of a challenge, but you got to get numbers and decide how you know for sure that you've gotten better. Gut feel often doesn't work. And again, going back to that whole um, closeness to the process, it can uh, throw off your objectivity. But once you decide if you made improvements or not, you've done your check step, you have two routes you take. If you are, you know, this is the act phase. If you've actually made improvements and you're happy with where you are, you figure out a way to lock in the gains. So basically you standardize, you do training, you document the process, you remove unnecessary tools. For a kid, locking in the gains is a little bit harder, but you know, you've, um, you've decided that's how it is. So you just keep practicing that over and over. And, but you said that this is a new style, a new swing approach, a new batting approach. Um, but you, you work to make sure that it stays the same way. You take some videos and you, you make sure that they're not reverting to an old way on, on the field, but you do the same thing again in the office or on the shop floor. You want to make sure that you don't revert to the old way of doing things. If you did not complete your, uh, your goals and you're still behind, you just have to go back to your, uh, you know, a lot of people think you go back to the plan and re- do your plan, but you really have to go back to the pre and reassess whether the problem is worth solving. So assuming you've done all the things that you knew how to do and you've drawn a blank and you haven't gotten your goals, you either have to decide that you're going to live with a new state um, or continue to go after it. And sometimes it's okay if you um, make a half of the improvements you wanted to. This problem may no longer be in your top, and the top of your Pareto chart, you know, the 80-20 rule. It may have dropped down, and instead of being the second most important problem that your company is working on, it may be the seventh. In baseball, if your son has uh, improved his batting average by 100 points, but he wanted to go up by 200 points, you may decide that um, improving pitching is now more important or improving throwing or fielding or something. So there's a limited amount of time and resources for practice time. You have to decide what is the most important. But that's the whole... Um, point of this is you keep making improvements, you keep coming up with a new assessment, you keep looking at what is the new way, the better way of doing something, and you'll continuously see all of your opportunities for improvement uh, shuffling around as situations change. So that's um, just was my thoughts for the day on how PDCA relates to sports and in real life. A lot of what we do in lean is very closely associated with um, common sense approaches to things. So um, I'm going to wrap up here and just say, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, this podcast. I'm going to try and get a little bit, uh, a few more of these done on a more regular basis. And this is Jeff Hajek signing out for the Gotta Go Lean blog.